I am very just very pleased um, to welcome our speaker today to the Lean Forum. The Lean Forum is uh, run by the PMCB, Peter Maritzburg and Midlands Chamber of Business, and we at TLC Training Leadership Consulting support um, the PMCB with this forum, as well as with the um, annual KZN Lean Conference. And myself, I'm Tanya Hulse from TLC, and my role today really is just to um, welcome everybody and to introduce our guest speaker today. So without too much further ado, just briefly about Johan, Johan Janssen from Rendsburg. He's currently the group manager at Sumitomo Rubber, which is based in Ladysmith, but uh, he has a very impressive CV with previous roles, um, both as an independent consultant in asset management, but also working as a general manager, factory manager, engineering manager across a number of Elovo mill sites such as Nordsburg and Sazella. And prior to that, he's also worked for Marensky, Anglo-American, and so on. Now, a couple of meetings I've had with Jan, Johan, his, his passion for reliability and maintenance engineering and so on, shine through and it's been such a pleasure to listen to him in our meetings and learn from him and so I'm really excited today to allow a few more folk in our network to have the benefit of of learning something um, from Johan today. So I'll hand over to, to Johan um, and he's obviously looking to make it as interactive as possible as a session and share ideas but also get ideas and input from yourselves as always with a forum like this, I think it will be great if um, if we need to, if bandwidth is a problem, we can turn our cameras off and I suggest let's stay on mute until unless there's something you want to say or have a question, you can obviously put questions in the chat. We'll pick up on them as we go at the end. Um, and yeah, let's, let's make it a, a fun session. Over to you, Johan. Um, good afternoon, Tanya. Thank you very much. It's really a, a privilege to be here this afternoon. And I think with all the rain we've had, we can say this evening already, it's um, very dark and dingy at the moment where I am. Um, I must say I'm missing Peter Marisburg. It's been, the time <laughs> I've been in Peter Marisburg has been great. Um, but yes, it's um, interesting to be involved in a different, in or another industry at the moment. Um, like you said, I'm currently the group manager at Sumitomo. Um, I'm also going to just turn off my camera. I'm sure nobody wants to stare at my face. Um, what I will, will do is I will share my screen. And um, so I said to Tanya, just waiting. I hope everybody can see my screen. Yeah, that's there so you can see. Symbiotic organizations. Right. Um, and I said to Tanya a bit earlier today or yesterday, she said, um, what I'm, am I, can, can you see the screen, Tanya? Maybe just. Yes, uh, just, perfect. I'm at, I'm different. All right. So, and I said to Tanya, I'm not going to do a death by PowerPoint. Um, I really do like using mind maps. So for those that can see the screen, um, there's, there's a lot more behind this. And I was going down a bit of a rabbit hole um, with this topic um, when I looked at, and the title that Tanya gave is the symbiotic relationship between lean and, and asset management and reliability. And like Tanya mentioned, I've been in various roles in different organizations and I've, I've had the pleasure and the privilege to, and the frustration to deal with, um, help with um, lean implementations and techniques. And obviously I'm an electrical engineer by profession and I've been in operations and maintenance for most of my career. Well, all my, all of my career. And I've, I've seen it in the, in the late eighties, early nineties where technology, and you can see I've got this, um, little um, World Wide Web, IT, Big Data, um, Data, Information, and IoT, and they're starting to connect, and it's, it's quite a big disruptor in organizations and in industries, 
and it's leading to this symbiotic organization where and if i talk about the organizations if we and we as in op operations we so often fall in the trap i just want to make sure i've got the chat open sorry i just want to move the one screen around so i can see if there's anybody wants to um make a comment or please in this um feel free to chip in or ask a question while i go through I'm not professing to be an expert in in the lean topic. Um, I've had the, like I said, I've had the privilege and the pleasure to be involved in it. And however, I, from an engineering and asset management and reliability point of view, I've seen over the years how the two is symbiotic in nature, and often people and organizations will focus on the one to the detriment of the other. And the age old challenge that's always been there, and I've seen it through many industries, is that the that approach between manufacturing um, or production and engineering. Maybe we can just keep it simple for that. There's often that conflict between production and engineering. However, those goals are the goals are the same at the end of the day. At the end of the day is to make money for the organization. So what I've done is I've just sat with a mind map and I have developed and like I said a bit earlier on, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole with some of the stuff. So it gets quite detailed. And I just want to show the interconnectivity between a lot of these activities that we see between lean practices or manufacturing practices that we see in numerous organizations and the relationship it's got directly to your asset management and reliability techniques. Now, we are, we, a number of us and most probably all of our, all the people that's attending this afternoon has heard of these, have seen it, have experienced a number of things, either when you, you look at Six Sigma and you look at the May process, We've got define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. And um, if you want to know more, contact Tanya. Don't ask me. Um, but um, those are the in the Six Sigma, and in those you have the key principles of lean. If you can see at the top corner, where and I, I bookmarked just the word value, and the value obviously also appears in if you see in the define. It talks about what's the value to the customer at the end of the day. All right. It talks about the voice of the customer. Um, maybe just let me make my screen a little bit bigger. Then you can read the notes as I hover over them. It talks about the voice of the customer, the value stream map. And it in those, and I know the defined phase when you look at the DMAIC process, it's quite rigorous and it forces you to define the problem that you're experiencing very, very clearly and very often that defined phase, it's sometimes a stumbling block. And all these techniques reflect in one way or another when it looks, when you look at asset management and reliability. But like I said, I just want to focus on the word value for now. And Please, um, we're not going to be able to unpack a lot of these things. We must probably just going to briefly touch, and that's why I just took a couple of th key themes to look at this afternoon and just to show the interconnectivity. So the word value appear in Lean, Six Sigma, all these manufacturing um, techniques that a lot of organizations apply, rightly so, because at the end of the day, if you don't, generate value to your customer at the end of the day while you're in business. And you must probably find yourself out of business at some point in time. So let me just go across to the, the engineering. So if you look at engineering, you look at, and maybe let me just go back. If I look at, if you look at manufacturing, I've got your manufacturing, mining process, petrochemical, agriculture, services. Um, doesn't matter what industry you're in, um, Component manufacturing for motor manufacturing. There, there are a number of techniques that has grown with industries over the years. And a lot of them 
are very similar in nature. However, you have to find those that works best for your organization. If you're in an FMCG or I see a number of people from Polyokia, the industry has, has got its own dynamics when it comes to um, making packaging and it's got its own challenges. However, a lot of those principles do apply um, if you if you look at it. So as you look at engineering as well, you've got engineering, engineering, design, systems engineering, which is actually quite a fascinating subject. System engineering and something that used in the military quite successfully and very in depth. And system engineering um, has been around for a long time. And I'm, I'm pretty sure a number of you might might have come across system engineering. I've looked at it in a bit more detail over the past few years. And I must admit it's some a subject that is vast in itself, but very successfully used in the military. So if we then unpacked the and sorry about that, my mind map just goes all over the place. I just want to, unfortunately, I can't, I just want to show you quickly as you shrink the mind map, the word value and where I've related to value at the, the opposite side when it comes to asset management and reliability. So for those that do not know, um, maybe just a quick history. Um, Asset management and reliability has been around for many, many years, as we know, in different forms. And towards the, the 60s, 1960s, around about there, there was a lot of activity and a lot of it was driven by the military industry um, after the Second World War and during the Second World War around maintenance and reliability concepts, the, the birth of RCM was in the kind of correctly late 60s, mid 60s, the concept of RCM. Um, however, it was so slightly different. It was de developed in the aircraft industry. And so over time, these techniques developed and grew. And with the, the, the computer dawn, if you can call it that, in as we maybe know it in the early 80s, it happened long before then in the 60s, you already had computer technology developing, but only when it became commercially available. Um, early 80s, we we saw the development of CMMS systems, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, and EAM systems. However, the asset management and reliability, if you can call it that, industry battled and to maintain plant has always been a challenge. And in 2008, um, the public PASS 55 was developed in the UK, um, the publicly available standard for asset management and reliability that where, and there was a lot of people involved in the, the compilation and the writing of ISO 55,000. And ISO 55000 came, was, became um, commercially available in 2014. So as a standard, it's been only been around for a few years. However, it's been around for in many forms and shapes over quite a long period of time. And ISO 55000 refers to value. Also, now this is related to asset management and reliability and the structure it refers to is if you look at the value it says um the concepts that is used as and named as value within an organization um value for organ you can see the note that is up there and these are these are not please these are not my exact words but this is our paraphrase quickly so the specification the spe specification of value of organization is stakeholders can vary even within an organization and value is prescribed in ISO 55000 as an asset that adds value to an organization right now the value is referred to um, if it does not add value, 
if it doesn't realize your video, I'm just making this a bit bigger. Oh, sorry about that. Um, you have to revisit why you maintaining or why you're looking after this asset. All right. And over time, ISO 55000 has grown. There's a lot more organizations that's implemented it. And where you on the left hand side, maybe um, refer to value from a business point of view, manufacturing point of view, from a lean point of view, um, you also look at value within your asset management and reliability. If you say the asset must add value to the organization or to the process at the end of the day, and you need to maintain it, looking at this, the value it adds to the organization. And in, in many ways, it's a, it's, a, it's a mindset change that has been brought into the asset management reliability approach to things because for many years, things were, or equipment or assets could have been possibly over-maintained, under-maintained, not replaced at the right time, right? Or been leave to operate it for too long at the point where it compromises quality and the value of your final product to your client or to your customer at the end of the day. And that is very important when you look at from an asset management point of view. Um, and that value is also prescribed in ISO 55000. It can be tangible or intangible value. So it actually ascribes customer reputa uh, um, brand reputation, um, environmental, um, where you've got a risk that you can damage your brand or your name of your organization. All those are ascribed to in how you approach your asset management and reliability techniques within an organization. And that those values um, then as you can see, the note here can include commitment to standards, ethical behavior, or social responsibility. And that's where there's a link. If you start now looking at, if you look at the lean practices that you have, we'll also look at, and that's where the interconnectivity between these activities are. And the challenge that you have as any organization is not to replicate what you do on the one activity when it comes to lean and manufacturing practices and what you do in your asset management and reliability or maintenance, let's just call it for a simple word, in your maintenance activities. And you then would implement a number of techniques around value over life cycle of equipment, all right? Um, you can see the value derived from asset asset system can change over the life of the asset um, and re-looking at the value of that asset over the life of the asset um, life of the asset and what value it brings to the organization in the form of delivering the, the bottom line at the end of the day and then applying the appropriate maintenance activities to it or when do you replace it um, within ISO 55000, well, not even ISO 55000, but in, within life cycle, the disposing of the asset is also included in your total life cycle costing of an asset. Um, a good example of, and I'm pretty sure I don't think any of us in this room is involved in nuclear power stations, but the life cycle costing of a nuclear power station is fairly expensive if you look at the total life cycle because you are responsible at the end of the day as a business to dispose of that asset effectively at the end of the day. So that is just quickly looking at value. If you look at, like I said a bit earlier on, if you look at value from uh, manufacturing or principles that you use apply in manufacturing um, environment when you have implemented Six Sigma, or Lean or 
or the manufacturing techniques, it has got a direct link to your asset management as well or your maintenance when it comes to, to value. So I don't know if there's anybody that would like to, um, rambling on, um, would like to add or like to comment at this, at this point. Please feel free to unmute yourself. I think um, certainly a thought from my side, Johan, is that I think looking at everything from the perspective of value, first and foremost, what is value to the customer? And then, of course, leading from that into what is value for the organization is a very important principle to bear in mind and understanding it from that as a big picture principle and obviously maybe a longer term, not only short term, is a very useful way that can help people sometimes decide between what might otherwise be um, conflicting or competing objectives or interests between departments, <laughs> between teams, between, yeah, et cetera. So I think uh, your point so far is certainly around the role of value and understanding and really understanding value is actually quite a crucial one regardless of which side of the fence you might sit. Yes, very, very valid observation. And what is very interesting, Tanya, is um, very often organizations are grappling with it and a lot of them have had good success around a strategy for the maintenance or asset management. And it's taken on different forms in different organizations. I've had the privilege to work and I still do with a large mining company at the moment, and they have got a five-year journey to align the asset management and, and reliability with their company's um, strategy and vision. And this is what is quite um, good, if I can call it for better word, with using a framework like ISO 55000, it actually forces you to align your asset management strategy with your organization's strategy and mission and vision. So often we find ourselves that we think the strategy within the organization when it comes to maintenance is different than the goal of the organization at the end of the day. And that's maybe one of the areas where asset management or maintenance has been lacking for many years is how do you align your activities around your management of your assets very well. And I've seen some good and some not so good maintenance strategies. However, what it does do, it forces people to think, why are they maintaining equipment? And it, it sounds quite horrendous coming from an engineer is why do you why do you maintain something at the end of the day if it does not add value to the business it doesn't um, add value to the customer at the end of the day and your customer could be an internal customer between production and engineering but it needs to be very clearly defined how do you add value it's a it's a big topic as a lot of organizations grapple with it However, it also drives very specific behavior when it comes to your maintenance reliability techniques. And I've got some of them, you can see in the pink, they're sitting there, the screen. Um, it drives certain behaviors as well, which is very, very important because the, what has shown um, over the years, there's been quite a number of research has been done around asset management and reliability. And a very good example is the Mars rover that went, they sent the, the US Space Agency sent to, to Mars. The first Mars rover, I think, lasted a couple of days, then it failed, and then they sent the next one. And I can't remember exactly the names, but the one Mars rover um, lasted nine months on Mars without any maintenance intervention at all, because there's nobody to maintain it. And you have to ask yourself how often 
do we touch a touch piece of equipment and after you've touched that piece of equipment you have a reliability problem or the piece of equipment fails and that is the challenge that i would like to put to everybody that's engineers or working in maintenance or asset management in part of your organization look at how often you have a failure after somebody went and maintained it it's more often than we actually realize that it's very very important to start looking at the value you add through your maintenance activities and often that value is is actually diminished by some of the things that we do because we believe it's the right thing to do but not necessarily it is the right thing to do so there's a bit of a challenge that I that I'm putting out there then I just want to if there's any I just want to do a bit of a reality check with and my challenge this afternoon is for all the engineers out there please don't I may be far enough away that nobody can stone me but um, it is something that I've also had to adjust my mindset around maintenance activities. So there's here's just some nine principles, right, of good maintenance, if you can call it that, for a very specific word. And for those that is in the production environment, to have the expectation that equipment will never fail. Um, Maybe a bit of an unrealistic expectation. However, that's why I just want to do a bit of a reality check here with everybody, just to highlight this quickly. So, just want to move this a little bit, because I'm just going to delve into this a little bit. So, accept failures. A failure will occur, and we have that in our normal day-to-day -day lives as well. All right. Most failures, and this is contrary to maybe what a lot of us, or I've also had, like I said, my thoughts challenges around, most failures are not age related. Studies have shown that a lot of the failures from an asset manage, from a maintenance point of view, is not related to age. Very, very few. A lot of failures are very, very random in nature. And I don't think we, we have time to delve into this. But if anybody wants that information, that information is available in the public domain. It's not, there's no copyright to any of this information or anything. I'm happy to share that with anybody that would like to look at. There's been a number of studies done, especially in the US, been expanded to Europe and um, a number of areas of the, of the globe that a lot of failures are random in nature. All right. Some failures matters more than others. As we know, very often, some of the consequences of failures are significant, all right? Um, you might have wear out rates, but you still gonna have equipment breakdowns. Hidden failures must be found. I've seen this, and I'll, I'm gonna just take one or two of these and just um, expand it a bit more. I've seen this, in my career very very often when it comes to root cause analysis and that's where the connection between some of these maintenance reliability techniques that i've got and a number of you would have heard about these is so closely related to the production or the manufacturing when it comes to six sigma and those when you look at the define the define phase of the demaic process it's very very deliberate to force you to define the problem very well. And this is where hidden failures must be found. And there's a number of techniques. And there's another interconnectivity between activities that happen in one part of the business and it does happen or should be happening in the maintenance part of the business at the same time. It just looks slightly different. However, it takes a very, very similar approach. I just want to. So the define phase. Uh, all right. 
the defined the defined tools that I've learned. This, there's 22 steps in that. If I'm right, so Tanya, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I just pulled out my little demaic book quickly. So, root cause analysis, and I know a number of. This is a wide, the note that says widely used technique for analysis of failures and often used in developing effective tasks and to address those failures. And those hidden failures are not often, and especially when it comes to in the engineering teams, especially if you're in an environment where you firefighting, you are very quick to get to the root cause because you get production off your back and it's often not defined the root cause not very clearly defined well you need to spend time on that all right identify um, identical equipment does not mean identical maintenance it sounds crazy but it actually is true they have proven this through the rcm and with the birth birth of rcm in the aircraft industry They've identified this quite detailed in that often the same type of aircrafts might not require the same maintenance. All right. This is a very important statement here, principle number seven. You can't maintain your way to reliability. So that's a very, very important statement. This is um, a statement that was made by somebody that I've had the privilege to work with for a good few years now, Steros O'Hanlon. Um, he's fairly well known. He's done a number of, written a number of books with a number of authors. And this statement is made not just off the top of his head, is from the literature and the studies that's been done over many, many years. They have found that over maintenance of over maintaining a piece of equipment does not make it more reliable. In fact, it actually can be detrimental. All right, so good maintenance programs don't waste your resources. It definitely doesn't. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to implement it. And good maintenance programs becomes better maintenance programs. And that is so true. Um, and we've seen it, and I'm pretty sure Tanya and a number of people that are online that has implemented the lean techniques or the make principles and organization that are very rigid in it. And I know companies like SA Breweries and Toyota, and those are the ones that come to mind very, very quickly when you talk about um, practices when it comes to manufacturing. They've proven that the better they, the more they do it, the better they become at it. Like Gary Player said, um, the more I practice, the luckier I tend to get. It just shows the better, and you need to put up a, a when you construct a good maintenance program, uh, if the fundamentals are in place over a period of time, people do get and they see the value of it. And it adds significant value at the end of the day to an organization. All right. I don't know if there's anybody that wants to, I just want to talk about these age related just quickly for people just to look at this. All right. So I mentioned it briefly. I just want to make it slightly smaller. Uh, hopefully everybody can read that it's on here. So the, the, the research of the aircraft industry shows that 70 to 90% failure modes are not age related. Right. All right, the, I haven't got the failure patterns here. Um, So the failure patterns also highlighted that infant mortality is common and that it typically pers persists, all right? However, there's a probability, all right, 
of failure only becomes constant after a significant amount of time in service. Right. So it sounds like it's contradictory where you say, well, I just mentioned that age is not necessarily a, a determination of failure. However, if you look at the, the analysis and the research has been done, there are very specific equipment that will fail um, due to age. All right. However, it's not that common. All right. Historically, maintenance was done in the belief that the likelihood of failure increases over time. That was the first generation of uh, maintenance thinking. Um, it was a thought that was well maintained and could reduce the a well maintained equipment could reduce the likelihood of failure. And that's also been in a number of ways disproved. All right. So in practice, I said, maybe I just want to make this light. In practice, this means that 70 to 90% of equipment would benefit from some sort of condition monitoring. Um, and only 10 to 30% can be effectively managed by a time replaced or overall. And that's very often your first line of defense. Um, condition monitoring has changed significantly and with the um, improvement in technology, it has become a lot more sophisticated in determining what the potential failure could be and when it will happen. All right, and the one challenge is that we have that most PM programs are um, based, time-based replacement and overalls. And that leads to additional failures or it leads to money spent on asset management or maintenance that was not necessary. And that is one of the challenges in the mindset that needs to be changed in a lot of organizations when it comes to when and how do you maintain equipment. We so often over maintain equipment. Um, another one is overly lubricate or lubrication or lubrication approach to asset management needs to be critically reviewed. Um, it's something that is very often overlooked in organizations and the cleanliness when it comes to lubrication and applying the appropriate lubrication to the right equipment at the right time to the, with the right amount is sometimes and very often not evaluated effectively. The, the determination of lubrication and, we, and when and how it needs to be applied is really, really um, critical to, to successful maintenance practices. All right. I know if there's any, any comments, any questions. I've been doing all the talking, so I would like, please, anybody to. Hi, Johan, Morris here. Uh, yes, more from, from TLC. Uh, maybe just first allow me to compliment you. I think you've taken such a, a big subject so far and just highlighted some of the really good stuff. Um, uh, you know, I'm reasonably familiar with, with, with lean from the perspective of, um, you know, from the improvement perspective and the, and the culture perspective. And I find some of the things that you're presenting very fascinating. Um, yeah, I love I, I love testing assumptions, you know, and I don't know how many of those have been busted in people's minds today, but certainly I've been challenged so far. Um, the, the, the one thing I'm just wondering about <clears throat> and, um, you know, maybe it's uh, it's not something that that has a, a simple answer, but I'm trying to think of the implications of. I love the fact that we're saying value. You know, assets can be looked at as from a a, a perspective of um, realization of value. Um, you know, whether they're adding value to the customer uh, and to the bottom line, or or not adding value, um, and that those can be tangible and intangible. So I'm, I'm good with that. 
I think that this is a very different way of looking at assets than the normal kind of accounting or, or assets and liabilities kind of way where we assume everything that we own is an asset. So I find the concept very interesting. I'm just wondering um, around the implications of finding that you possibly have assets that you are maintaining um, that per definition is hard to associate with critically where the company is at right now as being value adding um in your in your strategy um i think it's it's an easier guideline if you're going to be purchasing equipment and you've already got that mindset but what do you do if you have existing equipment um what are the actual implications of that kind of definition um is there any basic guideline you can give there all right so th this is a so i just highlighted this quickly um so this approach to so a uh, criticality matrix is where you would start with, and, and, and I know a lot of us, majority of everybody will have the same challenge around you've maybe inherited assets or you in your organization, the assets are quite old. And what is very important, you can see here, um, when you develop a strategic asset management plan, for your assets in your organization. The aim will be not to have the same approach to every piece of equipment. And hopefully I'll answer. So you can see here in the block, you've got asset type one strategy, asset type two, and asset type three, all right? And you would then look at, if you have a criticality matrix and say which equipments are critical to the operations, um, to the organization, and you will then develop a strategic asset management plan for that type of equipment for your organization. And it might be that the strategic asset management plan for that piece of equipment is run to failure. It is a is a acceptable approach that you can take. Um, and I don't know if that answers your question, yeah. Morris, but that's that's how you so you need to be very deliberate in looking at the assets there could be an asset it could be cheap enough to replace or there could be an asset that is 30 years old you can't find space for it um, and you need to maintain it very well so that that strategic asset management plan will look different for that piece of equipment maybe because of criticality of its nature so you have to do the matrix and then and that's where a lot of organizations, when RCM, RCM, like I said, was developed in the aircraft, you most probably all know it was developed in the aircraft industry. And RCM2 was developed by John Mowbray, that has unfortunately passed away a number of years ago. And it was to apply RCM2 into the manufacturing environment. What is actually very nice, and these are South Africans that developed it. So there's a Maurice Besson, I've had the privilege to, to meet him and had some interaction with him over the years. He has taken it a step further and developed RCM3, where he aligns the RCM process with ISO 55000. And it then, that you do not, because RCM in itself is a very lengthy, costly process, and very often organizations feel that you need to do RCM to really figure out what maintenance you need to apply, that necessarily is not the case. You do not have to do it on every piece of equipment. You must probably just do it on some of them. And your strategy on your for that piece of asset will determine how you would treat it and the value it ascribes to the organization as well. Um, so yes, hopefully that that gave you some and it's it is, it's very broad discussion around this, but you have to be deliberate in the way you um, look at your assets. Yeah, no, thank you so much, it does, definitely. Yeah, so and you can see here as well, and this is what's, so I, I've, I've had the, the privilege in my career to see the, maybe the, 
the start of ISA 55000. And I'm not, um, please don't, don't um, get me wrong. I'm not saying people need to go out and get ISA 55000 certification. That's not, that's not the idea at all. Um, as soon as you mention ISA, people really very often shudder because they just think of, think of audits and the implication it can have. And I've been through a fair share of that. But what ISA 55000 does, it, if you follow this, um, the structure of it, it will force you to do certain things in a specific way. And there was a number of, of role plays in South Africa. There was 168 countries that was involved in writing ISA 55000. And there was a number of people from South Africa that was involved. A few people that work at Cecil, et cetera, et cetera, that was instrumental in developing. And you can see uh, it's very deliberate. If you look at, um, sorry, it just highlights. So the terminology, that's sometimes something that we need to wrap our hands around, heads around, because it talks about a SAMPIA, Strategic Asset Management Plan, and you will think that is the high level, but the, your asset management policy, you can see at 5.2 sitting there, is actually the overarching policy that you um, do for the organization. And then you start breaking it down to um, developing strategic asset management plans. And those will then inform your plan maintenance, programs that you put in place, your inspection routines, the frequency, et cetera, et cetera. And that will start informing you, do you go down the road of implementing RCM or whatever techniques you need to determine exactly um, your planned maintenance approach you do on that piece of, on that asset. And it's important around structure, processes um, that is very, very important in within an organization that you apply the same to your asset management as well. All right. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. I don't want to, I see it's 10 to 6. Tanya, I don't, I have, I have a lot more that we can delve into. <laughs> but I just wanted to touch on these two um, mm -hmm. um, briefly. I wanted to go into some of the maintenance reliability techniques that, that's around. Um, there's a whole, sorry about that. There's a whole, and you can see I've labeled them here. Um, you've got root cause analysis, RCM, um, failure modes, and effects now, and criticality analysis. Um, uh, RAM studies are very interesting ones to do as well. We look at reliability, availability, and maintainability of equipment. These are effectively done to help you de-bottleneck um, plants as a as facilities as well. Very interesting approach to, to do. Very time consuming in itself as well. But the, the metrics is that a lot of organizations mean time between failure and mean time to repair. All right. Um, these are things. However, um, you need to be very critical about the analysis and the values you get when you get um, when you analyze that. What is critical is making sure that the data that you use to help you with the calculations is quite accurate. The other challenge, you know, something that um, we can as a whole subject on its own. When it comes to CMMS systems or EIM systems, um, or like people refer to, we've got SAP PM or we've got this maintenance system. That's when one of the challenges that is only a but a tool in your reliability and maintenance practices within an organization. It doesn't form the foundation of your asset management in your organization. Just, just a comment, a throwaway comment that I would like to add. Yeah, I think um, certainly from my point of view, what's one of the most fascinating sort of elements around all of this is 
look on some side it can be it, it quite complicated i mean look at all these acronyms uh, you know that one would have to deal with and the models and the systems and the so on that underpin things but equally it comes down to elements that are practical sensible um you know if you look at uh, lean principles for example 5s let's remove clutter let's make sure we focus on only what's important let's make sure things are clean all of those in their simplicity underpin a lot of these concepts and philosophies you know within the reliability space um if we can see where things go wrong we have a chance of catching them before they do and or limiting consequence um yet it ties into deeply scientific and um you know really actually quite complex concepts at the end of the day and i think that's one of the things i find quite fascinating about this field johan yes um the one the one challenge we have tanya and it is so um if if the data is not clean you can end up making really really terrible decisions mm -hmm. um and Research has also shown, and it's, it's scary to know this, and this is not just South Africa, this is worldwide, that only there's only about 30% of organizations where the CMMS um, or EIM system when it comes to maintenance and asset management is actually well used. People are confident that the data that's in the computerized maintenance management system or asset enterprise management system is accu accurate. Data is up to date, it's recorded well. Um, it is actually quite scary. Um, the, mm. Very often we talk to somebody and say, have you got a maintenance system? They will say, yes, I've got a maintenance, I've got whatever brand it is, it doesn't matter what. You say, do you believe the data that's in there? No, I can't trust it or everything is not recorded, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and this is not, yeah, like I said, this is not a South African phenomena. Um, I've had discussions with people in the US, it sounded like the typical things we hear that is just in South Africa, you lack of skills, the data is not accurate, um, all sorts of things. And you would think um, we're not unique. South Africa is not unique when it comes to the challenges. Um, I've also had my thinking readjusted around that. Um, a lot of organizations have very, very similar challenges and very large organizations have got um, very similar challenges that small ones. And if you don't have the disciplined approach of putting the fundamentals in place, and there's a number of fundamentals that needs to be put in place, um, you, you're going to battle. Mm. And a lot of organizations do battle. It's not, that's maybe one comfort that everybody can get. Um, don't feel alone if you, the maintenance is reactive in nature and um, there are unforeseen breakdowns. Um, and yes, you can plan for a breakdown as well. It's maybe something that um, we can have a debate on. Um, some other time, but yes, for the engineers out there that is responsible for maintenance, you can actually plan for breakdowns. It sounds crazy, but yeah, it's true. Mm. All right, Tanya, I, I don't know. I've, I, like I said, I've gone, uh, when I started with the mind map, um, for those that maybe just want to see, so this is not completely, um, this is just briefly what I, what I have put together. There's a lot more to it. Um, it, mm -hmm. it gets a bit more detailed, um, especially around the ISO 55000, um, where it talks about the purpose, the context of a strategic asset management plan. I just want to, sorry, we don't have time to go into that and I don't want to bore people further with how it breaks down it forces you to look at how you approach a strategic asset management plan for equipment. Um, just gives, um, it is quite a, it's not complex, it is time consuming, 
and rightly so, at the end of the day, you need to apply a lot of these practices and techniques in order to make sure that um, you manage your assets appropriately. And I'm using the word appropriately um, and often over maintaining is not necessarily the appropriate way of dealing with your assets. Yeah, I think uh, that's one of the things that's fascinating about this is that, like all too many things, uh, what do they say? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. And uh, often that might apply as well in our maintenance strategies, where we think we're doing the right thing by throwing plenty of effort and time and resources and cost, when in fact something um, that might in fact be simpler and more cost effective could in fact be better. If we just stand back, mm -hmm. take a step back and understand based on the key principles, what is it we're trying to achieve and how do we create value? Uh, by looking at it from that perspective, we might well find we can eliminate a lot of clutter, which is the leading principles, of course, focus on value adding to the customer. And then I think the other point that taps nicely into the Six Sigma side that you mentioned, the value of data and the value of accurate data and the ability to differentiate between the two and the good and not so good data, and then how to use that data. How do you interpret it? How do you ensure you don't jump to conclusions just by looking at simple averages or something to that effect and using a lot of the tools and techniques to make techniques lean Six Sigma statistical analyses to ensure you do arrive at the right root cause analysis and therefore the right countermeasures or steps to achieve the desired levels of reliability. So I think, Johan, you've given us some phenomenal food for thought here. <laughs> so I just want to leave it maybe with these four points. As you were talking, I just highlighted there. All right. And this is, like I said, from ISO 55000. That's how the assets contribute to organization's activities and examples, delivering products and services to the customers. How uh, the asset management activities realize value from assets and enabling the achievement of, of organization objectives. How uh, the asset management system enables coordination, control, performance management, or measurement, review, and continual improvement. And please, when it talks about asset management system, it doesn't talk about a CMMS system. So just for clarity. And then the last point, and I think a lot of us find ourselves in this role, the importance of leadership, clarity of roles and responsibilities, culture, communication, cross-functional. That is actually very, very important. So maybe I can just leave it with those four points. I see it is exactly six o'clock. <laughs> well done. I think what we must do, Johan, is, is see if there are any um, comments or questions, um, allow a little bit of silence perhaps, and see if anyone has any uh, further notes. Um, I'm imagining that you've probably sparked quite a bit of thought and people will want to reflect and they may well almost want to come back and ask some questions um, and or raise or maybe take a couple of the points further. And so what I will do when I pause is I'm happy to type my email address into the chat. If there's anybody who wants to ask questions and I can put them in touch with you, Johan, or we could see whatever needs to happen in terms of follow-ups, but uh, there might well be opportunities to have further or deeper discussions in one or two specific areas, depending on people's interests. So let me just pause there um, briefly and see if there are any other comments, questions, thoughts from any of our other participants today. Hi, Johan Leonard here. Yeah, look, I think great, uh, great job on the, the discussion. Um, so it's certainly a it's not an easy topic to cover, you know, what, what you've covered. And yeah, I certainly like the way you've applied the, the mind map tool and, you know, how it just sort of unfolds and expands, you know, in terms of what, you, what you're what saying. So, yeah, well done on, on, the, on, the, on the topic. And I guess, Tanya, thanks for hosting it. Um, you know, and I think there's just, there's just so many things that we can learn from this. You know, I mean, it's certainly got the old thinking uh, hats going again, um, you know, and I think I think it's, it's it really comes back down to the principles, right? If we understand the principles, we can apply a lot of this. Doesn't matter which industry we're in, you know. Mm. 
And then the big thing is about keeping it simple. You know, we we can easily make this such a complex topic, um, but if we apply the principles and keep it simple, you know, you're actually quite surprised how far you can take things. Mm. I think you'll often get further, particularly when you're dealing with your shop floor teams and operators, artisans. If we can translate the complex to the simple and the and the obvious, I think we, we empower them. I think they mm. get it. The leaders don't. <laughs> <laughs> True. Often. I think, Leonard, you've got some really good observations. You know, a, a, a subject that's very interesting is the approach of defect elimination or operator-driven operator, operator -driven reliability. Yeah. Um, that's something, you know, the operators are your first line of defense very often, and we very often ignore the input. It might not come across as technically... Um, adept people, but they view things in a very simplistic way and they get to the, they might not technically describe what the problem is, but if you bother to have some time and listen to what they're trying to explain, yeah, um, very important, like you say, keeping it simple. Um, in getting to that simplicity, it, it can be complex, but it takes time, like you say, it's time to sit and reflect a bit. Um, and it, you to take take the noise away, that's that's the challenge. Um, yeah, I think some organizations leaders, have done it very well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think often the leaders forget that, you know, most of our effort at work is really there to support the, where the rubber hits the road, right? To take away the obstacles, to make the equipment reliable. You know, I think we often forget that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, in, in lean mindset, go to Gemba, <laughs> go to where the value happens, go and see for yourself. Yeah. That's yeah. the reality of it. And not sit in our offices or and necessarily just look at the screens. Um, sometimes the answers really are simple as, as going and seeing, mm -hmm. finding the real truth. But yeah, thanks very much for this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, if there's anybody that wants to delve into the, a specific topic, um, I'm happy to point you in the right direction or send some information and have a discussion um, around this. I think there, there are opportunities, are huge opportunities to learn from each other, um, especially when it comes to this. Very often we also think industries are unique, and they are. Mm. Don't get me wrong. Industries are unique in its and what they do, but there's a lot of commonality when you look at across um, different industries. Mm. I've I've had the privilege to get some really good eye openers looking at really a big range of industries, and there's a lot of things that are very very common or similar. Um, it's actually quite phenomenal that we actually we we so often isolate ourselves from people around us because we get so trapped in dealing with our own day-to-day -day issues that you don't get time to look over the fence and see what other industries are doing and yet there's some solutions and in industries that can be applied in in your own um, but that needs that in itself the collaboration takes effort and time as well so yeah indeed and as you say, I think uh, often the best problem-solving tool we used to say in the old days was actually the telephone. Obviously, nowadays we have other devices too, but just pick up the phone and uh, or device and reach out. Find out who else might be yes. battling with the same problem because it's a, there's a fair chance you're not alone with whatever problem it is you might be dealing with. And sometimes the quickest way to get to an answer is just to reach out and see who might be in the same boat. So, yeah. Yeah. So true. so true. All right. I think, um, you know, noticing the, the time and that, and I think we certainly have contacts um, where we can pick up on the threads and the key points that uh, Johanna's raised. I'm more than happy to say um, we can leave it here and put my camera on briefly and say uh, good evening to everybody. Hope you all had a, a good session today. 
huge thanks from my side for Johan for his time and of course all the preparation as you can see that goes into this and grappling with a topic that um, has many facets that uh, you can spend your life studying and pulling key elements of it together to share with us tonight so we really do appreciate that and your time and we look forward to yeah hopefully future engagements on this or similar topics for all those of you who've um, joined this uh, Lean Forum for the first time, it's something we do run several times during the year, and we are always looking to tap into what are relevant topics, ideas, things that people would like to talk about. We sometimes talk about things as basic as 5S, uh, you know, visual management, value stream mapping, et cetera, et cetera. And then from time to time, we tap into, let me call it more sort of um, advanced or linked or complementary topics, such as we've done today. So we always welcome input from others and the opportunity to learn across um, cross industries, uh, cross companies and so on is, is really valuable. So any ideas, thoughts, suggestions, we would really welcome. But other than that, then I think just to say um, final thank you for everybody uh, and wish you well. Stay safe, especially in these times. Look after yourselves and yeah, let's keep doing the good work. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks, Thanks Johanna. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Enjoy the evening. Thank you.